I'm now going to move to, maybe I should just quickly explain the global workspace. OK, so this is a diagram from um, uh, Stanislas Dehaene, um, who is a, a French cognitive neuroscientist. And the idea is that these, the outer circle is the periphery of your body. These uh, 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 nodes are, are neural systems. The links are, um, uh, syst uh, are links between neural systems. The filled-in ones are active. Um, so here's his idea. The idea is that you have a um, uh, you have the, the sensory surface produces a lot of activations. There's a competition among them. Some of them form active coalitions, and then they trigger ignition into the frontal lobes. Um, when, th when, the, when the ignition in the frontal lobes makes the, um, uh, the stimuli conceptualized. So I've been talking a lot about the difference between unconceptualized and conceptualized. This is a, 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 um, 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 a, a theory of what it is to be conceptualized. Um, OK, so here's the, I'm just going to quickly get to the methodological breakthroughs, and I think I'll only probably be able to do one of them. So my two hypotheses here are that conceptualize the stimulus requires global broadcasting. This is called global broadcasting, when these active coalitions trigger representations in the front. Um, hypothesis two is that non-conceptual conscious percepts do not require global broadcasting. So now a method here that I could use, OK, maybe I will do this. So this requires red and green glasses, which I happen to have brought with me. Actually, there's no time to pass it out. You know, I'm going to pass these out anyway, and then I can come back to it. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So please don't touch the red and the green. Um, and then I'd like to have those back at the end. So until those are all passed out, which is going to be a while, I'm just going to, I'm going to go on. So if you look at this through red and green glasses, what, here's what you get. You get first a face, then a house, then a face. Fills your whole visual field. Okay? It's called binocular rivalry. There's, uh, um, you have incompatible representations, and, and the, the processing streams involving both the two eyes duke it out. Um, and interestingly, you can, uh, um, this is a terrific thing for studying consciousness because you have an unchanging input with changing conscious percept. Um, so, uh, and that's a lot of people to identify some areas that are more active when you're conscious, like the fusiform face area of a face, and other areas that are active, more active when you're conscious of, say, a, a house. These things have, um, um, if you ask people to report whether they see a face or a house, what you get is frontal and parietal links being the key thing here. And that, that has been taken to support the global workspace idea. Um, however, um, eye movements can be validated as a measure of consciousness. So the key here, this is what's called a a no report method. So here's the problem. Reports are an index of phenomenal consciousness. You know, if you say you saw it, probably you did see it. They're also an index of access consciousness. How can you use reports to distinguish between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness? It seems impossible. People have said it's impossible. However, whenever people say something is impossible, it's a dangerous thing because clever experimenters can find a way to make it possible. And that's happened here. So in an article um, uh, from um, uh, Wolfgang Einhauser's uh, group in, in 2014, by the way, I should say that the experiments, to the extent that I'm going to get a chance to go through these experiments, are all are very recent experiments. This is an area that is exploding in what people are finding out. And my approach to the hard problem is, um, you know, nobody can think of an answer to the hard problem, um, but that may be because of a failure of imagination. And the way to sort of you know, um, uh, juice up your imagination is to figure out how the easy problem works, how these states affect other states. And maybe by doing that, we'll be able to solve the hard problem. Anyway, so what Einhauser's lab um, found 
was that if, oh, so does everybody have the, uh, the, the, the red and green glasses? No. Oh, whatever happened to them? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What? What? They're all distributed, but. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, okay. So look, I'm just going to show you this. Those of you who have them, I just want to make sure people see. I, I'm. It takes a little while, so you may. What you should be seeing, if this is working properly is alternating house face, house face. Unless you have a very, very dominant eye. How many are seeing that? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're seeing the alternation. OK. Oh, good. OK. I'm sorry I didn't bring enough. OK, so I'm going to go back to this thing. OK, so all right, so. If you do the binocular rivalry with a grid moving one way in one eye and a grid moving the other way in the other eye, it turns out there's a nice index of what you are conscious of. And that index is called optokinetic nystagmus. And this is what the eye does. The eye movements indicate which thing you are conscious of. And it can be shown using people's reports that they correlate pretty well. But now there's this cool thing. You've got a rep uh, an index uh, of what people are experiencing. And now you can show them the original stimuli and don't ask them to report, OK? No report paradigm. OK, so here's what is found out. Um, so here's a quotation from the article. Importantly, when observers passively experienced rivalry without reporting perceptual alternations, a different picture, that is a different picture from the global workspace idea, emerged. Um, a differential neural activity in frontal areas was absent, whereas activation in the back of the head and the middle of the head persisted. We conclude that frontal areas are associated with active report and introspection. OK, so contradicting some of these earlier things. Now, I have a lot more on this experiment, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but uh, you know, I was very pleased to see this uh, because, of course, it backs up my view. <laughs> what I'm, as you know, Eric and I talked at lunch about, I, of course, I'm very most, what I'm most interested in is finding, you know, is, is getting a, 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 a leg up on the truth. But I have an independent interest in seeing my own views confirmed. Um, and this did it. Um, and quite a lot of these experiments have actually con uh, uh, confirmed, confirmed uh, my picture of this, which uh, I've been pushing for a really long time. So let me quickly switch to a different one. So I'm, this, this longer talk involves three different uh, techniques for avoiding the problem. But let me just explain the problem I'm trying to avoid. The problem is. Both views, me, this is mine, this is my opponent's, both of them end up with sparse cognition. So it seems that the basis of theorizing in reports is going to be the same in either case. So that's the puzzle. And then the one I just showed you is a way around it. It's called no report. But of course, reports have got to be in there somewhere. In the case I just showed you, the reports come before the experiment. The one I'm going to show you now, the reports come after the experiment. And I'll just do this very briefly. Um, this uses um, uh, something called event-related potential, which is a, um, a, a form of EEG. And then the idea here is this is my, my opponent, uh, Stanislaus Dehaan, one of my many opponents. Um, I'll just, I won't explain this whole diagram, but the idea here is this looks at the difference between seen things and unseen things. He means consciously seen and not consciously seen. And you only start to get a separation at about 270 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. So you can use temporal differences to get at whether it's a conscious perception or not on, on the global workspace point of view. So here's the technique. This is work done by Michael Pitts um, at Reed College. Um, so the paradigm is this. You have a ring 
uh, with these disks in it, and the task is to detect uh, a, a disk being uh, dimming. Okay, and and that focuses your attention on the periphery of the screen, right? Because it's a very difficult task. He, he calibrates it to be extremely difficult. Um, in the meanwhile, while the that's going on, there's constantly changing lines in the middle. Um, uh, so here's a, 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 an example of a square that occurs in the middle. Um, and he's, he set this up so that only about half the subjects notice it. So what he does here is the, uh, the first stage, which is probably the, the most significant one, is uh, he does 240 trials of this dimming detecting thing. Um, and then asks people afterwards whether they saw a figure. Um, and what he finds is that if they, the, uh, he does a long detailed questionnaire, he shows them various possible examples of what the figure might have been, and so he's, he's trying really hard to rule out guessing and other things. Um, so what he finds is that conscious experience correlates with uh, um, activations earlier than the global workspace at about maybe 200 to 250 milliseconds. So it's this temporal difference. So again, this supports my view. And I'll, I'll just uh, um, uh, quote some of the what he, what he says here. I won't show you the whole experiment. Um, but here's what he says. He says, the pattern results suggest that the neural events reflected in, and this is this ND1, ND2 is this stuff right here. Um, may be adequate in themselves to produce visual awareness, whereas more widespread activity indexed in these things, which occurs in 400 to 600 milliseconds, might be required only when the stimuli need to be processed further to fulfill the goals of the task at hand. This distinction parallels that made by previous theorists between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. So this is the first of, his, of many experiments that supports this point of view. And I won't go into all the details, but he, he, what he shows in, the, in this work is that um, it's re reporting. It's the cognitive processes uh, underlying reporting and, and conceptualizing that lead uh, uh, to global workspace activation. And uh, OK. Um, so. Um, so according to, this is a 2014 book by one of my opponents, Stanislaus Tahan, who says, when the prefrontal cortex does not gain access to a message, it cannot be broadly shared, and therefore remains unconscious. What I think is that that's unconceptualized, but in many cases, conscious. So just to sum up, um, the evidence for rich conscious perception um, uh, stems from these delayed indicators uh, from eye movements. And I didn't get a chance to do the ones about gist judgments. And so the idea is that uh, um, the, um, well, I haven't really justified this. But anyway, the, the thought is that um, um, uh, phenomenal consciousness probably is not as informational a kind of thing as uh, access consciousness. That, and uh, so I think. Um, is likely to resist um, a computer approaches, and I'm just going to stop.